This is Mariela and the CHN marketing team. Hi, I'm Benjamin. Hi, I'm Lulu. Hi, I'm Olga. And today we have a special guest, CHN's chief of pharmacy, William Parker. Hello, how are you all doing today? We're good. Thank you for being here today. I'm excited to be here. So as an expert, uh, we're bringing you in to know more about what's going on in the pharmacy world. Um, one of the things that we've noticed is how the talk around HIV has changed. Um, we wanted to ask you, how has it changed from what it is now to what it was before? Yes, um, now um, people have a better understanding of the disease and it's looked at as a chronic condition versus, de versus a death sentence. Um, with the newer treatments that are out there, we're understanding that people can live normal lives and um, their life expectancy you know, can be normal as well. For example, um, I, you know, you, when you're driving on the freeway, you see a lot of like prep, right? Like a lot of uh, yeah. talks about prep. Could you tell us what prep is? So, so prep is a preventative. It's a prophylaxis um, combination therapy uh, for patients, not necessarily patients, people that are at higher risk um, of contracting um, HIV, and so. These medications can prevent someone from contracting the disease if they're taking this on a daily basis. And so one way to curb the, the transmission rates across the United States is to use uh, drugs like PrEP um, and programs that are associated with PrEP to uh, minimize the trans transmissions of uh, HIV. So that's and a good thing. They're, they're trying to normalize that it's okay if you're taking PrEP versus being quiet about it and not taking anything at all. Definitely. I could say that right now, the way the society sees this disease is changing. Like uh, like you said, there used to be a lot of stigma around it and people used to be, you know, maybe embarrassed to talk about it. But now it's changing to where, like you said, it's not a death sentence anymore. It's more uh, of a condition that you can treat and you can still live a full life uh, and, you know, enjoy your life. That's, that's true. Um, you know, in the earlier days, um, there were a lot of unknowns and then there were a lot of ignorance. Um, once things were, were vetted out, you know, you had some people that didn't want to touch anyone that had HIV, didn't even want to be in the same room. Um, you know, they were, they were just scared, um, not knowing or just, just not comfortable with it. And so that has changed. Um, you know, we can have people around us today that have it and we just not even know. Um, you have combination drugs that are one tablet versus taking a cocktail of three or four medications throughout the day. And then people, you know, why are you always going to take medicine? You know, things to that nature. And so it's a little more discreet, especially with the injection, you know, once every other month. And, you know, that's that's breakthrough. You may see the commercials that are out there. Uh, you know, they, they run a lot of commercials on television these days. Um, in regards to HIV, trying to normalize and show that it's, it's okay to talk about and that there are treatments out there that are, that are improving. Um, because you may have some people that receive a diagnosis, they go into a closet, they're depressed, things to that nature, and then they're not taking any medication. They think it's some of their older meds that may or may not work as well as they expect. And, and then it's, it's downhill from there as far as, you know, their well, overall well-being, you know, their their mental well-being, um, their health can decline if they're not taking these medications because their levels of uh, um, virus, the viral load will then increase. But you have uh, Cabanuva, um, it's an injection, and it's an injection that is given once or every other uh, month um, to the patient. And so they're, one, of the thing, one of the ways to qualify for it is to be on a therapy, currently on a therapy, that uh, is also working, a working therapy. And so basically, in a nutshell, if you're on a therapy and that therapy is working, then you can transfer to this injection versus those everyday uh, tablets. You know, not worrying about taking a tablet or a capsule in the morning or at bedtime or throughout the day, you know, go to your doctor's office, um, receive your injection once or, or, or every other month, and, and that's it. 
and it's keeping the viral load down to a very minimum or it's not detectable at all, which is great. You know, it's very impressive how the medical industry changes to where just a couple of years we go, ago, uh, we, there was no treatment. Or, and now we can see how people can live their life fullest with this disease. Um, so that's just impressive. And uh, I know that there's um, some medications and treatments that uh, can possibly reverse the disease completely. Is that true, William? Um, yes, there have been cases where people are saying they are HIV free. Um, there are still a lot of studies going on, a lot of testing and a lot of validating. However, that is occurring. Um, uh, I don't have a percentage in front of me on what percentage of people that are experiencing or, or having that outcome, but that is happening. Um, with that being said, you know, people look at Magic Johnson, you know, the famous basketball legend, and people often question him, you know, does he have HIV? Because he is someone that we know that has it, and he looks well, he acts well, and one reason is because he is well. <laughs> but he does uh, still have the chronic condition. And so he's, he's an icon, he's someone that we know and recognize. So we look at him and we see that he looks healthy. And so it's questioned, but that's just, a, a, that's attributed to these medications that we're speaking of. If you have someone else that may be in the same room with you or work with you or, or someone that you know, they may be in the same condition, uh, may have the same condition as Magic Johnson, and they may look as well as him, but we just don't know that they have the disease. So I had a question about that since you brought up Magic Johnson. A lot of people, um, you know, he looks so well because he has money. With these new drugs, how affordable is it for, you know, the average person? That's, that's a great question. Um, I'll start with, um, there's a program in the state of Texas, um, the ADAP program. And so it's an HIV program that if patients that, that can't, don't have full insurance, um, don't have the ability to pay for these medications, they're able to apply for this program and then receive their medications just for dispensing costs at their pharmacy. And so that dispensing cost is usually around $10. And so they're getting these medications that are $700 to $1,200. Um, even the um, injection, I believe, uh, Cabanuva that we're speaking of, which is several thousand dollars, is a part of this program. And so that's, it, it's an extra step in applying, but um, applying for it, you know, is very beneficial. And so uh, you have affordability. The Community Health Network is an organization that um, is a federally qualified health center that is eligible for the 340B program, which in, uh, includes discounted pricing. And those prices are, those price savings are passed along to patients um, that are in need. And so that's another opportunity for affordable care. And then the manufacturers will have some programs that may be limited to, you know, certain individuals within their income status, things of that nature, but they will, there may be an opportunity for them to ship medications directly to the patient. Um, I was reading about, I think it was a female that got like a, um, an experimental trial done uh, with the stem cell transplant. I don't know if you've heard about it. But if that is something that does cure HIV, even though it is experimental and I know that it's still in the works, do you think that that would be something that would be available to a lot of people anytime soon? Um, I would say within four to five years, um, it will be available to, I guess, the majority of people, um, you know, where insurance companies are accepting it at that point. Because in the beginning, you know, it's a challenge getting things paid for. And so then it goes back to what uh, Mr. Benjamin said, you know, affordability. Um, you know, so those early early adopters are those that are able to pay for those, uh, those services. But I would say about four to five years. Um, and that's the case with a lot of diseases. A lot of chronic diseases are having breakthrough drugs that are, that are very impressive. And the pipeline, um, I think, is about four to five years on a lot of those being into where everyday people are receiving those medications. Where, where is this, all this um, innovation coming from? Good question. Um, so you have the pharmaceutical companies which have been doing research for years. Um, and one of the shifts is you have biotech companies. And so you have technology that is 
making a path to work in common in, in cohesion with the pharmaceutical companies or work standalone on treatments and therapy that they feel they can benefit um, America or the, the world with as well. And so uh, it, it may be a competition or it may just be, you know, the combination of both and, and where some of these these organizations partner together. Um, you have a pharmaceutical company that is doing great research. You have a biotech company that's doing great research and they really understand stem cell therapy, things of that nature, like uh, Lulu just mentioned. And then they come together and they come together with a product that is effective and it's working and they realize that it's safe and it goes through clinical trials. So within four to five years, um, you see it out there. No, Villain, this is great. This is very uh, impressive that uh, you know, these medications are so available uh, to people and they are affordable. Uh, so do you think with uh, more people using the medications, uh, would you think the overall spread of HIV can uh, lower down among the society? I say yes and no. Um, there, there are two ways to look at it, and I don't want to be pessimistic on one way, uh, and, I'll, and I'll explain what I mean. Um, in the event that these medications are, are, are being taken properly, um, the barrel load goes to unrecognizable, and so the transmission reduces or there is no uh, transmission. So that's great. So that does lower the amount of transmissions. On the other hand, if people understand that we have such great therapies out here, they may not be as safe with their practices. And then, you know, transmissions could to possibly increase or remain the same. I don't want to look at it that way, but it's a possibility. So I have two questions. Magic Johnson, he was very famous. Even, you know, my parents in El Salvador, a Hispanic country knew who Magic Johnson was. Do you think he was one of the first ones to get all, all those clinical in, in all those clinical trials? You know, that's a that's a great question. Um, I can't, I can't answer that um, as far as did he participate in clinical trials because I don't know the answer to that. But I mean, there is a possibility that he was in some early trials um, and trials that were effective and evolved into some of the drugs that are on the market today. Um, and you know, as we talk about clinical trials and these breakthrough drugs and the time frame that it takes to for them to be approved by the the FDA and to be on market you know, it's very possible that 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 was the case. And then the second one is going back to what you said that now, because there's, for example, like there's PrEP, so someone can take it and, you know, it would reduce or would eliminate their chances of, you know, getting HIV. Right. On a show that just came out on Netflix, it's about a gay couple that um, after 20 years of being together, they split up. So he starts dating again. And while he's practicing safe, you know, uh, safe sex, younger men are not. They just say, well, why? We have prep. So actually, they brought up that topic to the show because it said, well, you don't know what we went through so much to even get prep. So the fact right. that you're, you know, not even trying to uh, have any practice. responsibility. Yeah. <laughs> you know, that's, that's that unfortunate part in what I was, I was speaking on earlier where, you know, some may be responsible or more responsible than others um, and take more safe practices. And then others may lean on the, the newer medications and the technology and advancements in healthcare and depend on it. Um, it's a little riskier behavior, but that that can exist and can occur. Like we said earlier, you mentioned that PrEP was something that's more preventative. And for those that are at high risk, how can someone find out if they are high risk? Like, how would you actually know? Um, they're the, those billboards. So um, that, that Mariello just mentioned, they're trying to advertise that, you know, if you think you're high risk, um, then these opportunities are here for you. And they're trying to let you know that it's okay to ask questions, ask questions with your healthcare team, your healthcare providers, or the clinics that specialize in providing these um, treatments. Okay, so I have one more. And this is going back to social determinants of health. Um, we do know that the 
poorer the, you know, where someone lives, the less they're likely to find access to care or access to resources like this. How do you think someone that does not have FQHC, um, does not know about FQHC, could find care or even learn a little bit more about how to protect themselves? That's, um, that's true. And, and that's, that's a real question because it's, it's real that everyone doesn't know what an FQHC is um, or where their opportunities are that, that are enhanced for them. And that's where outreach is very important. It's important for the, the federal health centers to, to have a strong outreach team to reach out to these people, you know, whether it's their employers, it's uh, events that they may attend, um, schools, um, the, the billboards, the, you know, commercials on television. So I think it takes a collaborative effort on outreach to try to reach these uh, people that, that, that are in need. They have these social determinants of health and, and they may not otherwise know that um, where they can receive treatment or a better understanding of what's going on. I have no other questions. Is, is there something else you would like us to touch on, William? No, um, I, I thank you all for your time. Um, this has been great, um, uh, great questions. Um, I hopefully I provided great answers and I look forward to more, more podcasts with you. Thank you. Thank you for being here. And don't forget to demonstrate your love by sharing this podcast with your friends and family or giving us a review on Spotify or iTunes. Until next time. <music>